Well, good morning. Uh, we have so much that we get a chance to go through. I wanted to just give you two quick announcements as we get started. One of them is that next week is Bishop Pastor Parnell Lovelace's last official week uh, here as a staff member and preaching. So what I want you to do is I want you to save up all your hugs this week. Do not hug your children. Do not hug your spouse. You need to save these hugs for Bishop as we say uh, goodbye to him. And we're going to be praying him out um, as a church to go back and do his work there at Center of Praise. Uh, but he is going to be preaching and talking about the kingdom of God in this series. And I really want to encourage you to be here for that. Uh, he'll be talking about how do we get into the kingdom of God. We're going to be talking so richly about how powerful it is and how amazing it is and we need to be operating in it. But really, how do we get in to the kingdom of God? That's what he's going to be teaching us this coming weekend. So I'd encourage all of you to be here. And then lastly, we have the service adjusted a little bit today so that we're actually going to close with a closing worship song. And what that means for me is that we're going to have time for you to just have date time with God, right? So after you hear a message with a lot of challenge and a message with a lot of excitement, then all of a sudden you get a chance to just hang out with you and Jesus, you and the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, what does this mean for me? So you get a chance to look forward to that. Anyway, it's going to be exciting. Uh, I'm really, really looking forward to everything that we get to do together today. So let's get it started. Amen? Amen. 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 Take out your Bible and the handout sheet that was given to you at the front door, and we can begin. We are in part three of our Living into the Kingdom series, and I entitled today Evidence of Kingdom Living. And I want to recap, in case you are new to us, we've been going through a series saying that if indeed Jesus is our king, and we believe that he is, what type of kingdom is he leading, and how do we live into that? We're going to be going through the parables of Jesus Christ and understanding all the teaching he did about the kingdom. And we talked about the fact that if you want to boil it all down, the kingdom of God is anywhere that God rules. In other words, the kingdom of God can be within your heart if indeed he is the boss there. The kingdom of God can be in your home if he is the king there. The kingdom of God can be in this place if we all collectively agree that he is the master of us. That the kingdom of God has the ability to move out and it's almost like a bubble of atmosphere. That you are walking in a different reality knowing that he is the king and you're going to live out his way of living, amen? amen? So if that's the case, I said that when Jesus the King first came 2,000 years ago, he did six significant things. He did more than that, but we're gonna focus on six. Six significant things by which the foundation allows us today to live an entirely different existence. So I'm going to recap those six. If you go, wow, can you slow down? Uh, no, sure can't for a couple reasons. One, my personality's messed up. Number two, that's why I taught it last week. So by all means, you can go back and watch the video or grab the audio and, and pick up on that. But let me recap these because they're critical to what we're about to say. Six things Jesus did when he showed up as king the first time. Number one, he broke the hold of Satan. The devil ran a monopoly of bully power on the earth, and Jesus, the rightful king, led an invasion into his kingdom to reestablish his authority. Number two, he broke the hold of sin. He broke the hold of sin. Sin separated us from God, and therefore, in that distance, Satan took advantage of it and held that over our head. Jesus, of course, came in and broke the hold of sin by dying for the sins of the world. Number three, Jesus broke the hold of death. Another tool that the devil used to control us was fear of death. Jesus then turned death into glory so that we go from glory to greater glory. 
Number four, he inaugurated a movement to be followed, that he was a tangible, concrete example on what a human life completely surrendered to the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit, would look like. He was what the Bible called the first fruits that we would carry on like him. Number five, he brought the Holy Spirit here. He brought the Holy Spirit here that just as the Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Holy Spirit, and then what? When he came, he came with truth and revelation and power and said that he would indwell his believers. And number six, he put the world on notice that he would come again. He put the world on notice of his return. And what that means is that he said, what I'm doing right now is a down payment because I will be coming back and I will be making sure everything is right. All right, so our focus for today is on that foundation. We're gonna break apart a few of those a little bit more. What is the heart of it? I wanna draw your attention to the fill in the blank because really Jesus did something to limit the control of Satan and he led a movement for us to follow. When the Holy Spirit came here, it was a game changer. Let me remind you of this truth. Jesus Christ, when he came the first time, was not demonstrating his deity. The next time he comes, he'll be demonstrating more deity. He was demonstrating his humanity. The reason why that's important is just remember he did not do signs and wonders until after his baptism. And he went public. What happened at his baptism? The Holy Spirit came down. That same person of the Holy Spirit that anointed and lit up Jesus for all that he was accomplishing dwells within your chest. That's incredible. Therefore, we ought to be living like him. Here's the fill in the blank. Jesus equips his followers for victory. Jesus equips his followers for victory. Would you turn with me to Matthew 16? Matthew 16, 13. Uh, Let's see here. It's going to be around page, let's see, if you need a Bible, there should be one under the seat in front of you. It's around page 822. Around page 822. I'm reading out of the ESV. That's the English Standard Version, if you want to follow along with me. But I want to tell you this story. You probably know this one. But I got a chance to go over to the city over in the Holy Land, the city where this took place called Caesarea Philippi. It's a fascinating place because it has a natural spring that is really, really strong. Water comes up out of the ground and therefore they kind of organize it to where nowadays you go in and you see these waterfalls that come down. It's a very beautiful location. All the way around like a half dome is walls of cliff. And on those cliffs, coming out of them and dug into them, back in the ancient world, it had temples of all these different religions. There was the temple to the god Pan, if you remember that. Uh, It was in this multitude and international multi-god area that Jesus took his disciples on a field trip. He said, all right, guys, look around you. See all this stuff? Who do people say that I am? And they began to go, well, some people think you're a prophet and some people think you're a good teacher. And they started talking about it. He said, all right, that's that's cool. I'm more interested in what you think. What do you think? Who do you think I am? And Peter said, we believe that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus then responded to this in a fascinating way, and his response, one line, has catalyzed two massive world religions to this very day. Let me explain. Matthew 16, 13, what does he say? Excuse me, let's look at verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You heard that phrase before? That one line 
is the reason that the Catholic Church, if you want to talk about the traditional Roman Catholic Church, this is the whole reason for the Pope. It's one line, which is what? Peter's name means rock, and after Peter displayed out this incredible statement of who Jesus was, Jesus said, you are Peter the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. Well, they took that to mean that it was primarily he was the one that Jesus was giving the power to, to lead the church, and the way that you would have power today is it has to successively come from Peter, which is called apostolic succession. That is the whole reason why you have an authority structure like there is one given leader, the Pope, and then there are multiple people that surround them. What's intriguing is that the Orthodox Church, if you're familiar with them, you'll go around our cities and you'll see Coptic Orthodox, right? Or you'll see Greek Orthodox. The Orthodox Church uses the exact same line, and if you ask them, they will say, we are the longest running true Christian religion in the world because we descend from Peter. Apostolic succession, this line. So once again, the world today, the whole world setup is really shaped by this phrase. What did Jesus really mean? Now you're sitting in a Protestant church, which means we may even have a different take on it, right? What did Jesus mean? Well, honestly, we don't know. But what is intriguing about it is that Jesus said, you are Peter, a rock, and that's singular. He said, upon this rock, and he used a word petra, which is plural. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What did he mean? Upon what? Did he mean Peter specifically? Maybe. As a representative of the church? Maybe. Did he mean upon you guys? Collectively, I got my disciples here. They are the first foundation of the Christian church. So I mean the plurality of leadership. Did he mean, Peter, what you just said, that statement that came out of your mouth that I am the Messiah, the son of the living God, on that foundational truth, I will build my entire church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What did Jesus mean? I can't say for sure, but I will say this. What he was building was a church, and here we are, and whatever it means, it means we have victory over the kingdom of the devil. Are we all following? Because it says the gates of hell will not prevail against it, which we have to pause for a moment. What do you mean gates prevailing? What the heck does that mean? Gates don't prevail. Gates just sit there. Well, really, it means the gates won't win. Well, why would the gates have anything of value? Because it's probably what's behind those gates that is of value. When it says the gates will not win, how are we going to get through the gates? Ah, that's where Jesus goes next. Verse 19, for I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What do keys do? They unlock gates. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We have the corresponding key to the corresponding gate that whatever Satan's trying to keep away, whatever Satan's trying to keep blocked, whatever Satan is building, we have the ability to open and dismantle. Hmm. What do gates hold in? Here's my belief. People. I think there's people behind those gates. What does Jesus love the most? People. So he wants them what? Set free. What are the gates made of? Well, I can suggest to you they're probably made of a lot of different materials. I'm going to give you five of them. If you want to write these down in your notes, I'm going to give you five different gates that I think that, that, that Satan utilizes to keep people trapped. Many times they are lies. But let's take a look at them. Number one, the gates of guilt and shame. Anybody ever been stuck behind the gates of guilt and shame? Uh, picture this. You realize as you grow up, 
that you are not a great person inside. Now, you've always tried to convince yourself that you are, right? You're like, no, 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 I'm a good person because you're usually trying to match yourself up against someone super jacked up. You know what I mean? Like, you're, you're always like, well, I'm better than that guy, you know? And when you start saying, well, I'm better than Jeffrey Dahmer, okay, that's a low bar, <laughs> right? Can we kind of kick it up a little bit here? But we always think that we're good people, but you know full well when you start to examine the selfishness deep down in your heart, you realize, I'm really not that good of a person. And then you start thinking, wait, 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 I'm not, real, I'm not always nice, I'm not always, and you start to get dark about yourself. Then you start spiraling into a guilt. I did what to who? Oh my gosh, I hurt that person's life. And then it starts to spiral down, down, down. Without a savior, who is to stop that free fall? That guilt and shame spiral will take you all the way down a vortex. But praise God, Jesus did something about that, did he not? Amen. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is a key, a truth, to break a lie, to open up the gate and get yourself out. Make sense? But we also use that to set other people free, amen? Amen, all right, number two, the gates of sin and death. The gates of sin and death. Our sin condemns us to death, and damnation. Therefore, sin takes on, uh, excuse me, death takes on this ominous tone and we're scared and we'll do anything to avoid death. Think about how much money just America alone spends on trying to avoid aging. Yeah? Um, now, we could surely just talk about the cosmetics industry and we have mighty amounts of dollars. However, what I'm thinking of is healthcare. How much do we spend on healthcare to not die? I mean, it's billions and billions and billions of dollars. Why? Because we're afraid of death. What did Jesus do? He turned death into glory and he did what? He said, even though you die, you will never die. And he brings in a concept of eternal life and suddenly Satan doesn't have that hold anymore. Number three, there's a gate made of fear and worry. Anybody ever been trapped in a gate of fear and worry? Uh, real quick, show of hands, how many of you play the what if game periodically, right? Y'all get stuck in what ifing, right? Well, I'll tell you, I'm a master at the what if game, right? My panic disorder doesn't help me very much, um, but my mind will wanna go into a whole bunch of places, why? Because things are out of my control, things are out of your control. What could possibly happen if we're not in control? And we start to freak out and panic. But what did Jesus say? He said, things don't need to be in your control because they're in my control and I love you and I know what's better for you than you do. Therefore, Satan can't hold that over your head because everything is as I want it. And that is a key to open up that gate that used to hold people in fear and worry. It all of a sudden begins to open up and we have freedom. Amen? Amen. Number three. Uh, excuse me, number four. Oh, very good. <laughs> Nicely done. The gates of sickness and death. The gates of uh, sickness and disease. Excuse me, the gates of sickness and disease. These lead not just to frustration, but to fear of death again. Pain, suffering, hurt, it diminishes our lives. And we search for meaning in our sickness and suffering. And we want reprieve at all cost, even to the degree of what? Self-medication. So in other words, there's a lot of people in the world that have hurt and pain and suffering that are holding them back in. And Jesus is saying, I have a key to open that up. What is his key? Well, it comes in two different directions. In one sense, we can talk healing, that healing is possible and real today. And that means that if at any point, Jesus does not want you to be going through that particular trial, he can merely with a thought transform that and renew your body 100% completely. Our church is full of testimonies of physical healing. That is a reality. But if we must walk through it, what did he promise us? That even that has meaning. 
Why? Because he said, everything works for the good of those who love me. What was his point? I will not let my children have meaningless activity happen in their life. I will import meaning and value even into your suffering. I will redeem the time so that what Satan meant for evil all mean for good. If indeed he broke me and I do have to suffer for a time, then what? Jesus will use that to transform my inner being where I become even stronger so when I emerge out of that trial, I'm an even more powerful believer. Meaning, that's a key. Opens up that, amen? Yeah, let's praise God for that one. Number five, spiritual strongholds. Spiritual strongholds. When we begin life, born in original sin, we are separated from God. But as we get older, God is constantly revealing himself to us. We begin to have an awareness that indeed God is speaking to us. What does Satan want? To run distraction and blocks. He does not want us to connect with God. That is what is called a spiritual stronghold. That is what we refer to as spiritual warfare. When that occurs, did Jesus ever give us a key? He did. He said, I have bound the strong man so that my children can plunder his house, meaning I made it so that he does not have an overall control. I've given you authority and power to get in and get the job done. You have the right as a child of God to call upon the name of Jesus Christ and push the enemy back and give boundary. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, those are types of gates. We are here to be set free. It says whoever the sun sets free will be free indeed. We're getting people out of gates. But remember, we are not just releasing ourselves. It would be a little bit awkward if you were the only free person in your neighborhood running around going, I'm free, I'm free. <laughs> Meanwhile, everyone else is in bondage. And what, we're not gonna do anything about that? It is not just about our own freedom. It is also about the freedom of others. So how do we set people free? Well, one is giving people the offer of the good news, the gospel, that they might have eternal life, right? But here's where we mistake about eternal life. If you take notes, write this down, ready? Eternal life is a quality not merely a duration. Eternal life is a quality, not merely a duration. What do I mean? Most people think I have eternal life. That means I get to go forward forever. Although that is true, that is only one part of eternal life. Eternal life is actually a quality of living, and it begins not at the point of death. It begins at the point of salvation. What do I mean by this? The other day I had a, a buddy of mine, um, Justin came over and he helped me uh, replace my water heater. I don't know if you ever had a chance, but to replace a water heater, man, that's fun, isn't it? That's a great time. No, it's stupid. Here's the thing. There's no way I was gonna do that on my own because it involved gas and water, both things of which I would destroy my family with. So I didn't do that. So he came over and thankfully he knew what was going on. But what's intriguing is we take out the old one, we put in the new one and all the, you know, fancy, we get it all hooked up. And then you have to what? Light the pilot light. Y'all remember the pilot light? Because nowadays we don't have a whole lot of pilot lights going on. But anyway, what happens is you have to push the stupid little button that goes click, 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 click for about 15 minutes, which is irritating, and you're just constantly pushing it. And then eventually what happens? A flame ignites and you hear it go, Whoa, right? And then you go, oh, it's on. That's salvation. Because what happens is, is that we are disconnected from God and we're walking through this world and it's very cold and dark inside. And then Jesus Christ says, hey, can I light you up? And you go, yes, please, come into my life. I surrender to you, transform me. 
and he steps inside through the power of the Holy Spirit and says, let there be light. Click. Everything starts to ignite from every cell of our bodies. Everything spiritually begins to move, right? And all of a sudden you're thinking and seeing things you never saw before. The whole reality shifts around you and you become spiritually alive. You are now connected to heaven with resources pouring down, with dialogue happening both ways. Now you're alive. That is eternal life. Amen? Yeah. That does not start when you die. It starts right now. The other way that we set people free is practically. Well, what would that look like? Well, I got a story for you. If you want to turn to me to Luke 13, 10. Luke 13, 10. This is a rather unusual story. Think about it through the lens of the kingdom of God. Binding, loosing, keys, gates. It says this, now he, meaning Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues, that's a Jewish house of worship, on the Sabbath. Sabbath is Friday evening to Saturday evening. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. Don't even know what that means. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Now, for anyone that has ever had back problems, you begin to feel it in your own bones when I mention that. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, how dare he, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day, which is just a bizarre reaction. Can we all agree? Shouldn't you all be stoked that you just saw a healing right in front of you? He's like, this is a terrible day to get healed. How dare you? (laughs) Verse 15, then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? What was his point? Hey, even on the Sabbath day, you make sure your animals get water, right? Okay, then. Verse 16, and ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, meaning a Jew, whom Satan bound for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. She was practically set free. She was inside a gate and Jesus went and opened the gate and she was free to walk out. Hmm. I want you to write this down in your notes. You ready? What does my neighbor want to be free of? What does my neighbor want to be free of? I didn't say what do they need to be free of. The church is very good at pointing out what everyone else needs. I said what do they want to be free of? Because here's the reality. They should be able to come to your house and get some help. Why? Why? You're Christians. Christians are ambassadors for the kingdom of God. It is our job to set people free. Free from what? Whatever Satan has them bound in. If indeed it is addiction, they should be able to come to your house and say, I feel trapped. What do I do? And we are supposed to have an answer. If they say, I feel like I'm stuck in this damaging relationship We're supposed to have some truth. If they say, I am bound and I'm sick and I don't know what to do. I've been to doctors and they can't help me. We're supposed to step in. Hmm. What does your neighbor need to be set free from? And are you the resource they can go to? You should be. 
If you ever think, what am I supposed to do about it? What can I do about it? Well, you're in the right place because that's what we're going to tell you next. Huh, interesting combo account I'm going to read to you because you go, yeah, 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 Jesus and all that. Okay, well, let me talk about his followers. I'm going to read you a combo account from Matthew, Mark, and Luke that says this. And Jesus called to him the 12 together, the 12 disciples, and began to send them out two by two and gave them power and authority over all demons, over all unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure and heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And these 12, Jesus sent out, instructing them, charging them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. And so they departed and went out through the villages preaching the gospel and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them, healing everywhere. Amen. Wow. That's pretty hardcore. Is that what you did last week? <laughs> nice. So let me ask you this. So whose job is it to set people free? Whose job is it to heal? Whose job is it to cast demons? Whose job is it to increase the kingdom of God on this planet? Well, in one sense, we would say, well, it's King Jesus' job. Kind of. Watch this story. Luke 9, 10, if you want to follow along. You probably know this story. It's a feeding of the 5,000. Anybody remember that story, the loaves and fishes story? Ah, maybe you haven't read it like this. Luke records this story right after Jesus sending the 12 out. So it says this. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned of it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Jesus, send the crowd away to go to the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. All right, let's catch up to the story. Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom of God right after the disciples had just done radical work. And it started getting late, and there was thousands of people there. And so his disciples said, let's talk practically. These people have some serious needs. You need to release them and send them home. As long as you're talking, they're not going to go anywhere. Right? They have needs. Look at the next line, verse 13. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. Oh, that's an interesting command. That's an interesting challenge. So what are they going to do? They're going to look around. They're going to check their pockets and go, well, that's not really going to happen, right? That's how they responded. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we're going to go and buy food for all the people. For there were about 5,000 men. Do you realize there were women and children there? So this is more like a 7,500 crowd not 5,000. That's an awful lot of people to try to feed, right? He said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each, and they did so and had them all sit down. 
Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied, and what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now, we're familiar with that story, and we go, yay, I love that story. That's a really cute story. Quick question for you. Did Jesus hand food to anyone? Only his disciples. Who handed the food to the people? The disciples. Did Jesus hand it directly to the people? He did not. He went through who? His followers. Who did the miracle? Jesus. Who gave the miracle? The disciples. Are you tracking? Here's the reality. We are the distribution house of God. He will always do the miracle. If you ever want to know where the power comes from, it's always Jesus. That's always the answer. But who's he going to give the miracle through? You. It is our job to go about and bring about the kingdom of God. That means that we lay hands on people. That means we cast spirits. Where is the ultimate power coming from? It always comes back from Jesus, but it's going to course through you. You and I are the agents. Jesus doesn't give the miracle direct. He gives it to the church to give to the people. Man, what are the ramifications of that? Are people not getting their miracles because you and I are unwilling to do it? Are there people that are still currently suffering or behind gates when you and I have the keys in our pocket? Is it possible that the Lord has to keep going around you to get stuff done? Why can't it be you? You have the same Holy Spirit that came upon Jesus. Well, I don't know how. Okay, then that's a practical question. But please don't say, I can't. You never could. And you can't right now. But Jesus can, and he does. But it's going to go through you and me. All right, let's keep moving forward. Write this down. God's calling is God's enabling. God's calling is God's enabling. If he commands you to do something, he'll give you the power to do it. And you go, well, that's the disciples then this happened. Luke 10, 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others that were not the apostles and sent them ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful. There's tons of work to do, but the laborers, those that are willing to do it in my name are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Imagine if the 72 saw this church, hey, we prayed for laborers, look at them. There's thousands of them. This, trust me, would have blown their mind, right? Oh, wow, there's tons of people to do the work, but we got to do the work. Jesus said, go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Verse 8, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it. Say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Verse 17, and the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, and I add, while you were out doing ministry, now he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. See, here's what's intriguing. That is not the apostles, that's the other followers. We are also the other followers. This is our crew. What have we been empowered to do? You're gonna go, but I don't feel like that. Well, hold on, you are like that. Why? Because of your Christian identity. See, who you are allows you to do things that are not natural to you. How do we know? Well, to be honest with you, there's one concept I've taught you quite a bit. We decided to have some visuals put together, and I want to throw one of those visuals on the screen. It is the covenant triangle. Maybe you are familiar with this one. Now, uh, I've talked to you, if you are listening to this audio, you're not seeing anything. 
I totally get that. Let me explain. On the top of a triangle is the word Father. Everything begins from God. Everything emanates from God. If you go down to the right on the triangle, our Father gives us an identity. Our Father gives us an identity. He says phrases like this, I have given you the right to become children of God, and that's what you are. He tells us who we are. You go, I don't feel like that. doesn't matter what you feel. It matters who you are. Our Father gives us an identity, and then zoom across the bottom of the triangle to the far left corner, and what happens is out of that identity, we can then obey him. Out of that identity, we can obey him. Be very careful not to go the other way around the triangle. Why? Because then you hit religion. Religion says that the father demands obedience, and if you obey enough, you get an identity. That is incorrect. That is performance-based religion that is not in Scripture. It's the other way around. It's initiated by the Father. It is bought by Jesus Christ. It is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, our Father gives us a new identity, and out of the abundance of that identity, we can do good things, right? Now, I've taught you this before. What I have not taught you is the kingdom triangle. Same thing, triangle. Let's overlap it with this one. It is what? If our father is the king, and indeed he is, then the king bestows upon his followers or his children authority. And out of that authority, we what? We utilize power. It derives from God, and it's because of who you are, not what you can accomplish on your own. If you look in your pockets and go, I don't have resources, you're absolutely correct because they're not going to come just from your pockets. They have to come from God. But indeed, our father is the king. The king can bestow authority on anyone he wishes. That's why Jesus, as he left his followers, he said, all authority has been given me on heaven and on earth. Therefore, go in my name. John 14, 12 should blow your mind. John 14, 12. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Works is a word for miracles, signs, and wonders. Let me read it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And, ready to get blown away? And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Amen. I'm sorry, greater than Jesus? Yeah, collectively, we as a church are going to do greater works than Jesus. Why? Because he's going to the Father. Why does it matter that he's going to the Father? Because when he goes to the Father, he tags who? Holy the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes here. And that which Jesus was blessed by dwells with you. Verse 13, what are the ramifications? Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. What does that mean? I have no idea. But it sounds awesome. You say, well, okay. I'm supposed to go live out the kingdom. So... Is there something specific I'm supposed to do? How, how do I operate? What do, I'll tell you this. Wherever you see a gate, get a key. You might have it in your pocket already. But here's what's intriguing. As if we needed more encouragement, the Holy Spirit gave us things called spiritual gifts. Anybody ever heard of spiritual gifts? Those are kingdom tools. Let me read this to you, 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Now, there are a variety of gifts, services, and activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. You know what everyone means in Greek? Everyone. Verse 7, to each, that's you, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, meaning the embodiment, the reality, the tangible, concrete outpouring of the Spirit 
for the common good, meaning for all of us. It's not for you to play little parlor tricks at home. It's not for you to get rich off of. It is for the common good to set one another free. That's what we do. For to one is given the spirit of utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions or hands out to each one individually as he wills. Write this down. I have been given more than enough. I have been given more than enough. You all, we are emissaries of the kingdom of God. If Jesus did it, we should look into it. Does that make sense? Why? Because he is the head, we are the body. When the head comes up with an idea, the body carries it out. We set people free. Hmm. I'm going to finish by giving you a shock to your system. You ready? John 14, 10. John 14, 10. Jesus said, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Remember, works is miracles, signs, and wonders. Look at verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the accounts of the works themselves. What was his point? You guys, I'm saying something that blows your mind. I'm God. That's really hard for you to swallow. I get that. If you can't merely believe my words, look at the proof and evidence. Why is that so stunning? Because here's my question for you. You're telling people a lot of heavy stuff as Christians. Hey, you got to believe in an invisible God. I'm sorry, a what? Yeah, and then when you pray, it's going to feel like you're just talking to yourself, but really, God's hearing you from heaven, and stuff changes in reality. What? And I don't know if you knew this, but you're going to hell. Now, don't get me wrong, it's really bad. Like, it's worse than you imagine. It's eternal torment. I don't want to freak you out, but you're going there. And Jesus came that if you accept him as your Lord and Savior, he will give you eternal life, and you'll never go there. As a matter of fact, you'll go where you were always destined to go, and that is in the presence of the Father. Okay, that's what you just told someone. And they're supposed to believe you? What's your evidence? Uh Uh-oh. You got anything to back up your words or are you still just talking? You're like, but that's Jesus. Hold on. Paul took it so seriously, he commented on it three times. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 2, 4. He said, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Man, we're talking heavy talk. Are you backing it up? What do you got? What evidence are you demonstrating that God is real, that the Holy Spirit is here? Or are they just supposed to believe your words? 1 Thessalonians 1.4, Paul said, For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. Why? Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Romans 15.18, Paul said, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and by deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. What does that mean? It means ministry isn't done until there's words and action. Paul and Barnabas ministered in Iconium, and it says, and they went out and were arguing with so many people and convincing them, but then some bad guys came in and stirred the pot, 
And so the Lord came in and brought mighty signs and wonders, and many were saved. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that today people still need evidence that God is real? Where is it? Can I have the prayer team come on up here? If you want to write down this note, write down, full ministry is word and action. Full ministry is word and action. If you are brand new to this church, whoo, that was kind of crazy, huh? I know you filled out one of those cards. Can you go ahead and take that to the smiley people at the Welcome Center outside right here? They'll make everything all right. <laughs> now then, here's what we're going to do. Our worship team is out here. We're going to worship a little bit more. During that worship song, the altar is open. That means that if you felt moved on by God right now, and you're like, man, I just want to go pray with somebody right now. God, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for me? Lord, what do I, what do I need to look at? Because here's the thing. I just shared a bunch of information with you. Your mind's spinning. I want you to go back to the safe one. Go back to between you and Jesus. And just have quiet time with him. You don't have to receive everything I'm dumping at you. Say, God, what am I supposed to know? This is a time for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is a time for you to engage with your God. The prayer team is open, not just during that song, but they're open afterwards as well. If you have any needs of prayer, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, whatever they might be, the kingdom leaders are here, and they would love to pray with you. Let's worship.